would like to invite everyone to please rise and join us in the singing of the Philippine National Anthem, which will be followed by our prayer. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this year's Kagitingan Historical Webinar Lectures 2022, A Filipino Perspective of Heroism and Valor. I am Felici Lois Lanya. And I am Maria Grace Lisa Hagro. And we are your hosts for today. Before anything else, allow me again to acknowledge the presence of the following Department of National Defense Secretary Delphine N. Lorenzana, PIVAO Administrator Yusek Ernesto G. Carolina, Viva Deputy Administrator Asik Raulis Di Caballe, NHTP Chairperson Dr. Rene Escalante, PVB Vice President Mr. Mike Villarreal, Mount Samad FDES Administrator Mr. Francis Inetorio, VFP President Dr. Cesar P. Pobre, Dr. Archie B. Rezos from the University of Santo Tomas, Dr. Jose Romel B. Hernandez from the De La Salle University, and Dr. Marilyn R. Nales from the Lyceum of the Philippines University, Manila. Also, we would like to extend our gratitude to the following institutions who are partnering with us in this webinar series. Armed Forces of the Philippines OJ3, Department of Education, Commissioner, Commission on Higher Education, Department of Tourism, National Commission for Culture and the Arts, National Youth Commission, National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Veterans Federation of the Philippines, Philippine Information Agency, Girl Scouts of the Philippines, Boy Scouts of the Philippines, Filipino American Memorial Endowment, Defenders of Bataan and Corregidor Incorporated. 
Right now, we have about 143 participants here in Zoom. Now, for those who are unable to pre-register, we are currently being broadcasted via Facebook Live on the official Facebook page of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office. Before we officially begin the program, here are some reminders for all of us. In case there are lags, just stay on and wait for it to load again. Zoom attendees are on mute to avoid background noise. Now, if you have questions, you may use the message box for Zoom attendees or use the comment section on the Facebook live stream. After the webinar, the participants who registered are encouraged to answer the evaluation form and the link will be sent on their email. Now, during our last episode, we were joined by our three resource speakers. First, by Dr. Ray Carlo T. Gonzalez, who discussed to us the Ilongo Ingenuity and World War II Panay, followed by Sir Modesto Saonoy, who told us the story of the little-known Battle of Lantawan and Battle of Patag in Negros Occidental. And during our afternoon session, Dr. Earl Jude Friope shared the interesting story of the Jungle University from 1942 to 1945. Silliman University during the Japanese occupation in Negros Island. Now, for those of you who, who wish to watch the previous episode of our webinar series, the recorded lectures may still be viewed at the official Facebook page and YouTube account of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office. And as part of our celebration of the Women's Month, we are dedicating today's webinar episode with a theme, Hair Story, The Women of Resistance in honor of our unsung Filipino women heroes and their contribution during the war. Indeed, there is nothing a man can do that a woman cannot do better in here. On behalf of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office, we would like to greet everyone a happy Women's Month. Now, our lineup of resource speakers for this morning's session includes Dr. Jose Victor Z. Torres, who will be presenting his lecture, the Victims of a Tragic War, the Order of Poor Clares in the Philippines during World War II from 1941 to 1945. And Ms. Naomi Hamera, who will be presenting her paper entitled Kababaihan ng Rebeliong Hukbalahap. And for our afternoon session, we will be welcoming back Ms. Desiree Benepayo, who will discuss Women of the Philippine Resistance. And finally, for our last research speaker, Mr. John Lee P. Candelaria, who will share to us his paper with the title, Dainty Hands Do Useful Work, Depicting Filipino Women in Japanese Wartime Propaganda. So without further ado, let us begin our program with an opening message from the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office Deputy Administrator, Asep Raul D. Cavalier. A pleasant morning to all. I would like to acknowledge the presence of our resource speakers, Dr. Jose Victor Z. Torres from the De La Salle University, Ms. Naomi Hemera from the University of Santo Tomas, our partner agency's representative, Attorney Christine Yuson Chavez, the executive director of the Philippine Commission on Women, Ms. Desiree Benipayo from the Philippine World War II Memorial Foundation, Mr. John P. Candelaria from the Hiroshima University, and Mr. Miguel Villarreal from the Philippine Veterans Fund. In celebration of the Women's Month this March, today's Kagitingan Historical Webinar Series is an opportunity to applaud and commend of our Filipino women veterans who selflessly served the country during one of its darkest times in history. With the theme, Women of Resistance, our resource speakers shall tackle the lesser-known stories of our Filipino women who bravely fought for the Philippines during the Japanese occupation. These women devoted their lives in fighting for resistance against the Japanese troops and have significantly contributed in the war efforts and consequently to the country's liberation. As we gather here to relieve the stories of valor and fortitude of our women war veterans, may we recognize their own brand of heroism and valor. As it is, courage is not defined by our gender, 
nor by our age and stature. It is not only limited to the battlefield as it can be displayed in different aspects of life. And our women are one of the most courageous for standing up against oppression and finding ways to serve in spite of the dangers of the war, either through taking up arms, nursing the wounded, or defending their families and children. May this webinar open more much-needed opportunities to talk and recognize the lesser-known stories of our women veterans. Again, welcome to this webinar series. Maraming salamat po. Mabuhay ang mga kababaihan and happy Women's Month. Thank you very much, Asa Caballes, for your welcoming message. This time, we will be joined by the Executive Director of the Philippine Commission on Women, Attorney Christine Rosary E. Yuzon Chavez, to deliver her message. The Administrator of the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office, Administrator Yusek Ernesto Carolina, Eva, Deputy Administrator Asa Raul Caballes, Vice President for Corporate Communications and Marketing Services Department of the Philippine Veterans Bank, Mr. Miguel Villarreal, to our speakers, the LSU Associate Professor Dr. Jose Victor Torres, Professor Naomi Hemera of San Juan de Letran, Vice President Desiree Benipayo of the Research and Education Philippine World War II Foundation, and Mr. John Lee Candelaria, Fellow of the University of Hiroshima, and to all our partners and participants who, who are here today. A pleasant morning to all of you. On behalf of the Philippine Commission on Women, I would like to thank Kivao for inviting us to today's fourth episode of the Kagitingang Historical Webinar Lectures. Today, our theme is Her Story, Women of Resistance, and I am very delighted that we are commemorating the bravery and dedication of many Filipinas who have proven themselves capable of being heroes. We are all remembering the stories of all the women who dedicated their lives to defending our country from the oppression of foreign colonizers. Today, we will have a significant presentation of how the resistance movements in the Philippines were able to prosper with the participation of women during the colonization period. This episode is a tribute and a homage to all the women of war, women of Bukbalahap, and unheralded women during the war, as well as those unsung heroes of the war and their shared history of valor and heroism. For many years, the focus of Second World War historiography in the Philippines has been on the male military officers and those who fought for the country. Aside from being key figures in the guerrilla movement, women were also trailblazers in various fields. This is a testament that modern historiography should deviate from the traditional male-dominated narrative of history by providing a platform for women's heroic stories from the past to be showcased. As we commemorate the National Women's Month, this is a great opportunity to celebrate the bravery of all our Filipina fighters. Again, I would like to reiterate, heroism is not confined to a single gender. Every young Filipina out there can also be sheroes in their own ways. May the stories of these women and their deeds of heroism serve as a source of inspiration for future female defenders who aspire to serve and protect the country. More importantly, may these stories serve as inspiration for all young Filipinas to thrive in any field of career that they choose. Before I end my message, I would like again to greet all our female participants, to all the women present here today, mothers, daughters, sisters, and female soldiers. Happy Women's Month to all of you. I salute you all for your heroic acts of courage and bravery. Maraming salamat po and stay safe. Thank you very much, Executive Director Guzman Chavez, for your message. Now, first in the lineup of our speakers for today is a history professor from the De La Salle University, Dr. Jose Victor Z. Torres. Dr. Jose Victor Z. Torres is a full professor at the History Department of the De La Salle University, Manila, and 
an associate director for drama and history at the Bienvenido and Santos Creative Writing Center in the same university. He graduated with an AB journalism degree at the University of Santo Tomas and an MA and PhD Manicum Laude in history at the USC Graduate School. He was a former researcher, researcher rather, for the Intramuros administration before he entered the teaching profession at USC and DLSU Manila. He is a multi-awarded writer, winning the prestigious Carlos Palanca Memorial Award for Literature five times and the National Book Award for Travel Writing in 2006 for his book, Shodad Murada, A Walk Through Historic Intramuros. In 2017, he won his second National Book Award for the Essays in English category for his book, To the Person Sitting in Darkness and Other Footnotes of Our Past. He is the author and editor of books on Philippine history and culture and a contributor for, of articles on history and culture to local magazines and university journals. He has also lectured in both local and international conferences on history and culture. Ladies and gentlemen, to deliver his lecture live, here is Dr. Jose Victor Zito. Good morning to uh, everyone. I hope, uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for that very uh, uh, long but uh, flattering introduction. Hindi lang ako sanay na ma-introduce ng ganyang kahaba sa mga conferences. Before anything else, as mentioned by ago by our host, hello. This, uh, this, my lecture will be live. Let's be, will be, uh, I'm on Zoom live. So I'd like to beg the indulgence of the, um, the uh, audience and my fellow speakers. No? Um, some out, outdoor noise might come in no? because, um, alam nyo naman yung uh, problema natin minsan pag uh, work from home, uh, Zoom na, no, may pasong tahol ng aso and everything. But uh, I hope that uh, there would be no <coughs> interruption, uh, much interruption. Here in the um, during my talk, no? so uh, let me share first my PowerPoint. Okay. The title of my lecture is uh, "Victims of a Tragic War: The Order of Saint Clair and the Order of Poor Clairs, not nuns, the nuns during." World War II, 1941 to 1945. If, if the Order of St. Clair or the Clarissas sound familiar, ito yung inaalala, inaalaya ng itlog sa Katipunan, the convent there. No, it, uh, if you, um, it's a frequent place to go to if you're, you're going to want to pass the bar, want to pass the, um, the um, exams for accounting, so on and so forth. No? So that's the usual place to go to if you have any petition. Uh, you want to uh, you want to be granted go to prayers. Uh, the normal offering that is given to the nuns are itlog. No, kaya yung sinasabi natin, kung gusto mo matupad ang yung mga kahilingan, mag-alay kayo ng itlog kay Santa Clara. And most of all, para hindi umulan sa mga occasion natin sa uh, events na mga yari, no? lalo na pag kinakasalo kaya birthday party. No? So, um... Let me start first from Nana. Let me start first with the introduction of my lecture. The, the history of the Second World War in the Philippines is both a story of valor and bravery and a story of tragedy and fear. The lecture I will discuss with you this morning is just one of such story that happened to a group of people, a religious order in particular, that lived through the trying period of the war and the Japanese occupation. Unlike the lectures that you will listen to later, the story of the Order of Poor Players or Clarissas, the, as they are popularly known, is not a story of resistance against the enemy, but a story of resistance against the hardships of, of the hardships of the war and resistance against the, tri the trials in order to survive. The Order of St. Clair was the second branch of the Franciscan order and was popularly known as the Women's Branch of the Order, founded in Italy by St. Clair of Assisi and St. Francis of Assisi 
in the 19th century, in the 13th century, sorry. It apparently coincided with the spread of the Franciscan order, kaya mabilis itong nag-disseminate sa Europe. No? Kasi it, it was like, you know, it was like a twin uh, religious order with the uh, Franciscans. Okay? So the order became popular no, throughout Europe, but it was only through uh, St. Clair's sister Agnes who managed to establish the community in Spain. Among the first cities to have uh, monasteries of the order were the ones in Barcelona and Burgos. It was not long after that the missions spread throughout the peninsula. By the time St. Clair died, there were at least 110 nunneries throughout the continent. 21 of these nunneries were in Spain. Then in the age of conquest and colonization, the order of St. Clair would eventually spread to the far-off colonies of the Americas in Spain and Asia, the first being in the Philippines. So the order of St. Clair here in the Philippines is actually the oldest existing religious order for women here in the country. No? <clears throat> The poor clares or clarissas in the Philippines began in 1621, making them, as I said, the oldest existing religious order for women in the country. The order was founded by Mother Heleronima de la Asuncion and 10 other clarissas. The picture of uh, Mother Heleronima is on the left. Now, the, uh, the tombstone that you can see on the right is, uh, is still the, the tombstone that can be, still be seen today in the monastery in uh, Quezon City. Now, it still contains uh, the remains of Mother Heronima. The history of surviving through the periods of transitions of the Spanish colonial and later the American colonial period now, is an interesting historical narrative. For they are a contemplative order who made every effort to survive through the chaos of transition while at the same time, avoid breaking the rules of the order. The main rule, of course, is that because they are contemplative order, hindi sila pwede lumabas ng monastery or ng convento. So once you take up the, you know, the once uh, you take up the uh, your vows to the order, you are no longer out, uh, allowed to go out of the monastery unless you have a special dispensation coming from the uh, Catholic Church. So managing to survive the changes of the times, the Clarissas were not able to spread their order beyond Manila. They only started spreading the order after the war, in the early, late 1940s and the early 1950s. But from uh, 1621, when they were founded here, until 1950, not more than 300, uh, at least about 300 years, they were the sole remaining uh, religious order for women. Uh, sole remaining. They were the sole order for women in the country that, that, that didn't have any branches. Okay? There are only uh, branches in the, uh, the one in Intramuros before the war. This monastery in Intramuros was the same monastery they had during the Spanish period when the Second World War began. Here are photos of the monastery before. Now, this is Intramuros in 1935. Santa Clara is here. Uh, I hope that you can see the cursor, uh, the arrow. Santa Clara is this one. Okay, This is the entrance to the monastery. Of course, this is the picture of the, uh, the uh, monastery from the outside. Mataas yung bakod eh. Kaya bihira tayo makakita lang um, layout talaga ng uh, area during the Spanish and the early American period. Okay? Ito yung loob. This is the, uh, the, uh, the main altar to the, uh, the church, and that is the choir loft. No? Um, the wall that you can see in the far far side of the uh, picture, that is, the, uh, that is where the nuns usually stay when there are masses. That area is uh, heavily covered with the um, grapes and, of course, and a grill to separate them from the, um, the public, and, and, uh, and you cannot see them. No? Uh, the public could not see them, but uh, during the Mass, you can hear their voices as they sang or pray, prayed to the uh, services. Oops, sorry. 
the coming of the war. The festive morning of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, December 8, was interrupted with the alarming news of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. War had begun. Panic and apprehension prevailed among the populace. Fearing that the city, Manila in Tramur or in Tramuros, no, would be the enemy's next target, Apostolic Delegate Monsignor William or Guglielmo Piani ordered that all of the religious women be evacuated to the suburbs. The Clarissas learned of the start of the war from their administrator, Don Perfecto Gabriel, who informed them to, pre to prepare for evacuation. The next day, December 9, six of the nuns, two laywomen, were brought to the convent of the Franciscan Venerable Third Order along Solala Street in Intramuros. This is now the campus of the uh, Mapua. In the afternoon, another group was led out of the convent no, along with the sacristan and uh, they were uh, brought again to the same place in the chapel of the Venerable Third Order. So the remaining nuns that were now left in the monastery had to make do with sleeping in the dining hall because they were already preparing to evacuate, pero naabuto, naabuto sila ng dilim. The next day, the threat became real. This was December 10. As air raids over the city began, and the remaining community was fetched by a priest to join them in the Franciscan convent. The fears of bombing proved to be true. On December 27, Japanese bombers attacked the River Harbor, sinking and damaging ships and destroying Santo Domingo Church, Palayo de Santa Rosa, Palayo de Santa Catanina, and heavily damaging Letran, Intendencia, and of course, nearby government and private buildings. After the air raid, the nuns were moved to the St. Anthony's Institute on Legarda Street in Intramuros. Then on January 1, 1942, almost the start of the Japanese occupation, Half of the community returned to the monastery. The St. Anthony's Institute, Institute in Legarda is still there. Ito yung simbahan na katabi ng Loreto, no, sa, sa Bustilios. Okay, that, that is an old building. No? In fact, the, uh, I think uh, it was renovated more than a decade ago, but, but it still retained much of the appearance of the old convent. When they arrived at the monastery, they found the convent badly damaged by the bombings of the previous week. Shrapnel and bullet holes pockmarked the walls and windows, and the windows were shattered. Concussions from the explosion had burst some wooden wall panels inside. With the rest of the populace, they waited for the arrival of the Japanese to the city, and the following months, the rest of the order was finally, uh, the rest of the nuns were finally joined by the other members of the order. Life in the community continued with almost the same normalcy as during the pre-war years. But the hardship of a war, war-torn country began to tell on the nuns. Hunger did not spare the poor sisters as their food supplies slowly got depleted. Remember, they were not allowed to go out of the convent and they have to have uh, to a lot to... Um, to have some uh, messengers or to have some servants who would eventually buy, have to buy food from them, for them. On September 6, 1944, the nuns held their elections. Elected abbess was Sorcon Concordia de San Francisco, who replaced an elder abbess, Sor Euphemia de la Passion. The same day, one of the nuns, Milagros de la Liagas, died of pulmonary tuberculosis. Now, this was the problem that the nuns eventually encountered. Many of them would eventually get sick. No? But of course, with the lack of uh, adequate uh, facilities no, for, for, um, for uh, medical facilities during the war, no, many of them stayed confined in the monastery, where from time to time, a doctor uh, would visit them. But then again, as we all know, because of the shortage of supplies, no, they only had to make do with whatever they had. During this time, the nuns vicar, Father Pedro Herrero, sorry, Pedro Hierro, mentioned the need for them to evacuate to a safe place. He suggested moving to the 
uh, Franciscan convent in San Francisco del Monte. This is uh, San Pedro Bautista Church today no, in uh, Frisco. But the community dismissed the proposal. No? In one of the loose pages of the memoirs uh, of um, Sor Carmen de Arcangel, no, the archivist, she recollects that Father Hero told her that Father Montero Garcia, ladder of the convent's vicar, exercised a great and ominous influence um, over the abbess who, who virtually opposed, opposed evacuation. Now, this is one of the curious things, no? About, you know, about uh, the Order of St. Clair. When the opportunity came to evacuate, they did not. No, and of course, uh, after the war, each was blaming the other. Now, uh, just a little, uh, just an aside pala, uh, the sources I used for this uh, narrative no, is from the actual diaries of the nuns that can, that can still see, be seen today in the archives of the community in Katipunan. A week later, the nuns requested from the head of the Franciscan order, Father Salvador Rodriguez, for their servants and families to live inside the monastery compound to, to give them shelter in case of danger from bombings. Father Rodriguez agreed. And uh, eventually, it's the reason why uh, before the war, according to the intelligence reports of the Americans you know, who, were, um, who were already um, all set, not to fight the um, to to shell um, in Tromuros not before uh, during the liberation, it was said that they they spotted a lot of civilians inside the monastery. On September 21, 1944, American bombers from captured airfields in nearby the Pacific Islands began their air raids over Manila. The, the attacks continued almost daily and the monastery suffered severe structural damage. You, you have to remember that the convent was beside the river. Kaya ulang binabanatan parate is mga ships that were uh, docked along the, along the river. In fear for their safety, some of the nuns moved downstairs to the refectory. No, yung, yung kanila kasing dormitory ay nasa second floor. Everyone had to evacuate and go to the ground floor, which is better because the second floor at that time was uh, was not made of um, adobe. No, it's not, it wasn't made out of stone. It was made, it's a wooden, no, no, wooden second floor. The bottom part, the ground floor, is made out of adobe stones. Realizing the danger of staying in the monastery, Father Hero asked the community to move to a less dangerous area outside Manila. Unfortunately, he had an argument with the abbess who told him that they, uh, they, are, they refused to leave, preferring to remain, putting their full trust in God's divine assistance. The matter was brought to Father Rodriguez, the head of the Franciscan order, who thought that the nuns should stay since there's, there was really no part of the city that was safe. What made them more firm in staying was a letter from from the apostolic delegate, Monsignor Piani, who said, as part in the letter, are by chance the nuns thinking of leaving? The only place they are sure of their safety is in the monastery. Let them all take shelter under the material cloak of the Holy Virgin, our mother. It is in this loving and sweet lady that they are protected and defended from all dangers. There was also concern from other sectors, especially from government officials and some civilians. But some Franciscans also expressed their fear that something might happen to the nuns if a battle does occur. Ang problema, ayaw pa rin talaga nila umalis. They decided to stay in the monastery, probably relying on the fact that Makapal yung walls, no, and uh, they could easily take shelter in some of the basements, so on and so forth. No? Um, due to the air raids, the Japanese began to place anti-aircraft anti -aircraft guns around the city, outside of the convent. Soldiers erected gun emplacements in the surrounding buildings and stockpiled ammunition dumps. Not in the convent itself, but the surrounding buildings, no? 
uh, the highest building that was beside um, the monastery was the Army Navy Club and the uh, Terminal Hotel, which is several uh, stories high. No, it was almost uh, as high as ano, the uh, the middle of the tower of Santo Domingo Church. Soon, the silence of the convent was broken by the sounds of anti-aircraft guns and, and machine guns as American planes zoomed overhead. It was not long before the monastery became a military target. On October 1, the convent was hit, destroying part of the second floor corridor, the bathrooms, the windows in the dormitory, the parlor, and some doors. Wala sila magagawa eh. The place, was, ano, the place was surrounded by anti-aircraft. No? Uh, I remember there was a story dun sa Kaburos. Um, Letran at that time was supposed to be a safe ano, safe place kahit na damaged na siya nung early part of the war. The only problem is the Japanese placed an anti-aircraft cannon on top of Letran. So pagdating ng Lula, pagdating ng atako ng Kaburos, binoba nila ang Letran because it's, ano nga, it's, it's, uh, it was heavily defended by the uh, Japanese. A week later, on October 22, Abes Concordia received the final decision from the Franciscan head to stay in the monastery until the Americans arrived. The nuns began to stock up on their supplies for the long wait. Of course, by the time in 1944, everything was so, inspe- uh, so expensive. The convent population at that time consisted of 48 nuns, two priests, nine servants, and the, um, the maid servant with his, with, uh, with his family. Sir Carmen de San Miguel tells the story, tells the prices of the foodstuff that they bought for their supplies. Ayan yung presyo. No? It is, this was the price in October. No, one sack of rice is 1,500 pesos, one uh, sugar. Sugar was uh, 1,000, 5,000, no? um, was raised to 5,000 two months later, and again to 9,000. One egg is 100 pesos, one kilo of meat is 1,000 pesos, bananas 25 pesos. In January, the prices would later go up. This is January 1945. One sack of rice, 20,000 uh, 20, pesos. One sack of camotes, 15,000. One kilo of meat, 1,500. One egg is 120. This is Japanese money. No, this is Mickey Mouse money prices. By the end of the month, the sanitary, the sanitary facilities of the convent broke down, causing an epidemic of this dysentery. A laywoman, Lucia Candare, was badly stri- uh, stricken. One of the nuns, Sor Maria de Nazareth, developed beriberi. News reached the city of the Americas landing in Leyte. Liberation was underway. The populace of Manila waited in suspense for the arrival of the Americans. But in the course of waiting for the arrival, many of them who got sick eventually died of dysentery. The community experienced difficulties in the internment of the dead. They could not bury their dead no, inside the convent. Although the nuns had fled, had, had their own cemetery, Inside the Monastery de Santa Clara, burials were ordered before by the Americans, the American health authorities so during the early part of the American colonial period, to stop the burials within the churches and the convents. I think kaya nakikita natin yung mga tombstones sa likod ng San Agustin Church, no? because that was the tradition before. Burials had to be made at the La Loma Cemetery several kilometers away from the city, but the air raids prevented them from leaving the convent. So what they did was to ask permission to bury mula their dead in the choir loft, which the authorities granted. Anticipating the American attack on Manila, the Japanese began turning it into a heavily fortified defense area. In the convent, soldiers began occupying sections of the compound a machine gun nest was installed inside the church itself. Still, the nuns tried to keep up ahead no, at a semblance of normalcy during the terror of the approaching battle. Two of the nuns were eventually um, given 
their um, solemn vows. No, but then again, the, the normal life that they had uh, was um, uh, was totally destroyed. Another nun on November 24 died of complications from beriberi. And as I said before, no, they were not allowed to uh, bury, they, they could not bury the bodies in uh, La Loma. They could not go out. So they decided to bury the poor nun inside the uh, choir loft. The days before Christmas, 1944, were relatively peaceful. The nuns were slowly, were slowly getting messages. Now, one of the messages that they got was a uh, drop via an American plane. No, it, it had the, um, the colors of the American flag. It's a piece of paper. And the written message, to our gallant allies, a very Christmas to you from the Americans in the Pacific, spreading good tidings to you. For all the years. But as they slowly waited in 1944, they were, not like the years before during the occupation, they were also slowly experiencing the terrors of the occupation. Remember, Santa Clara was beside Fort Santiago. And according to the accounts of the nuns, they could hear the torturing and the, um, the, the beating of the prisoners who were being killed were tortured, not suspected guerrillas inside the fort. Katabi-katabi nila eh. There only one, one uh, wall separated from the uh, separated them from Fort um, Santiago. New Year 1945 was greeted with a renewed bombing raid by the Americans. Reports reached in Manila of the rapid advance of the Americans. The danger of uh, the coming war, the coming "quote unquote" liberation, now was uh, so common in their minds that some of the nuns would eventually take it into good, good humor. No, lolo uh, no, uh, you, you just be patient. Malapit nasa darating na Americano, so on and so forth. No, um, on February four. The nuns were preparing for their morning prayers when the nun guarding the gate of the, of the, um, the monastery suddenly rushed in and uh, shouted out the news uh, that the Americans have arrived. The nuns were thrown into great joy at the news, but little, of, little that they know that it was going to be the start of their ordeal. As early as February 4, Manila was being set on fire by the Japanese. It wasn't long before the monastery itself no, saw many of the buildings surrounding the area started to go up in flames. They soon realized that they were going to be trapped. The streets were lined with mines and pillboxes. The Japanese were firing at every, everyone dwelling through the streets. Some of the nuns moving to the ground floor and the lower sections of the convent for safety. The Japanese, led by a certain Major Kitagawa, forced themselves now inside the monastery no? and, of course, started picking up some of the men who were living in the compound at that time. No? It, took them, uh, it took some negotiations with the Japanese officer before these young men were finally. Uh, released one uh, during one of the uh, one of the uh, hours no, of the uh, of the um, the battles that the, the the battles that were already happening, the male population that were held uh, inside Fort um, Santiago were over always brought out and placed in a warehouse. Dun sa halos katabi na ng ng ano ng monastery ano. There was another um, there was another incident where a group of men was brought out, which they later learned was from San Agustin Church. Many of them were priests, no? And also brought to the warehouse where they were held there by the Japanese for several hours before they were taken out again. No? Yung huling batch na ito na nakita ng mga madre were the batch of men that were eventually massacred in the 
uh, air raid shelter at the Palacio del Gobernador. Their bodies were found later after the Battle of Manila. On February 13, a direct hit from an artillery shell started a fire near the choir loft. Fortunately, it was put out in the nick of time. Realizing the danger of staying in the cloister, the nuns moved again to the dining area. From February 17 to February 23, Intramuros was subjected to an intense barrage from every kind of artillery gun that the American forces had. The, 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 uh, the monastery was already at that time considered a civilian civilian um, civilian area because it was a it was a church no they alam naman nila lahat din eh. there were intelligence reports coming in the problem according to the uh, the sources no the, the especially the writer of the diary that i used no ang problema was that when the americans uh looked at uh, through their binoculars no, from across the river they saw japanese soldiers in the monastery the problem the Americans had was that the area of the monastery was the area where they were supposed to land. Because they were supposed to, uh, to land if they were going to cross the river towards Intramuros. So they had to wipe out the defenses there. So it became necessary now to shell the monastery. At around supper time, on February 18, uh, for February 19, an earthquake struck the city, lasting for several minutes. The nuns fled into the garden. Unfortunately, the earthquake damaged a large part also of the city, uh, a large part of the uh, convent. It was during this time, much later, that the, the nuns began to really experience the horrors of the war. Uh, horrors of uh, the, the liberation. I'm not calling it a, um, a, a tidings of liberation, but the horrors of the liberation of Manila because it was during this time the Japanese now the, started burning the convent itself. Now, they were uh, pouring gasoline down all over the place. Nagugulat na lang yung mga madre na biglada lang ang fires would start almost everywhere. And of course, no, everyone was now panicking. They could not run out because they were going to be shot by the Japanese. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Dawn came the next day, around the early February, uh, around February 23, when Dawn came with the first artillery, artillery barrage, the American GIs prepared to assault Intramuros. So they were preparing now to cross the Repasig River from Binondo. The artillery bombardment began. In several minutes, what remained of Intramuros was reduced to rubble in the carpet shelling. At the Santa Clara Monastery, shell after shell smashed into the 300-year-old building, leveling the ancient walls of the ground and setting the remains on fire. The nuns were still inside. Confusion reigned. The nuns and the civilians ran as the, con as the convent collapsed around them and exploded in flames. One group encountered the Japanese soldiers in the convent, and one of the soldiers lunged at one of the priests and stabbed him with a bayonet. The soldiers fled after hurling hand grenades around the room. Realizing the danger they were in, the nuns made a run for it. When many bombs suddenly exploded, Mother Abbess shouted, we have to get out of this place. Many joined her. I quickly rose to Larry Tordo, who was uh, one of the nuns, and followed Mother Abbess, but some nuns preferred to stay there and die. Outside, we saw the battered bodies, mangled hip flesh, open abdomens, and flowing blood from the nuns. One after another, few figures Few figures scrambled up. Some could not hardly move, bleeding and stunned. I wanted to get a bundle of clothes, but a huge flaming piece of wood blocked my way. I saw a nun in agony behind the trenches, another wounded beside a dead body. 
I saw also a dead sacristan and another inching his way to the door. Suddenly, a huge piece of burning wood from the ceiling fell on him, killing the poor boy. Indescribable horrors. Sinwerte lang yung mga madre because at that time they were running out of the convent, the Americans had already begun landing along the Pasig River beside Fort Santiago. And they were the first persons, civilians, na nasalubong ng mga American soldiers before the actual battle was about to happen. So that was Father Hero with some of the uh, nuns. No, that, that's, that's still a crowd on, near the Intramuros area, the Pasig uh, River. This is a popular photograph no, that uh, we have seen about one of the casualties of the war. Um, this is this is one of the Santa Clara nuns no, who, uh, who sur survived the uh, shelling of the monastery. I um, during my research that was done no more than more than a decade ago, no, when uh, I was researching about this nun, it turned out pala she survived the war, no, and but eventually left the order, and she lived as a lay, lay sister down somewhere in Pampanga. I, I totally forgot her name, na, no, um. But uh, she died around mga 19, uh, 1990s. No? This was already on the uh, below the side. No? Um, one of the things that uh, one of the things that uh, happened as the nuns began to run for safety, nagkahiwalay-hiwalay sila. The, the, the group that was encountered by uh, the, the one with Father Hero was actually the first group that was encountered. This second group, the, uh, the one in the middle, the nun in the middle is the abbess, no? was uh, from the second group that they found several hours later and managed to bring them now to um, Binondo. On February 25, as the Battle of Manila raged on, the remaining group, led by Song Matilda de Santa Isabel, was found in the city. No? So, uh, they managed to evacuate all of the nuns. No? The casualties are recorded as follows. Seven Clarissas were killed. Several of the nuns were killed. Three lay women who served the nuns were also killed. And three male servants were killed during the selling of the monastery no? in, uh, in February 1945. But the greatest casualty of the uh, of the tragic war for the nuns was the was the uh, destruction of the more than three hundred year old monastery. This is the monastery, the one in the bottom near, the, near the, the bottom part of the picture. It's totally uh, damaged. Along with it, Intramuros, a city older than the convent, were in housed uh, older than the convent, died in the end of the battle. The surviving Clarissa stayed for a while at the St. Anthony's Institution in the one in the Garda before their fellow Franciscans decided to take them in and house them at the Colegio Serafico in the convent of the San Pedro Bautista Church in San Francisco del Monte. Before their transfer, they returned to the ruins of the monastery to salvage whatever they could find. Unfortunately, looters and scavengers had already picked through the remains of the monastery. What, what was a miracle was that they found the tomb of Mother Geronima still intact. So they managed to take out the remains and bring it with them to San Francisco del Monte. Being a cloistered order, the nuns tried to make do in, their following, in following their rules, even though the church and convent were always full of visitors. Eventually, five years later, the nuns learned of a, of a residential property located in the hills of Maritina. They negotiated with the former owner, an American expat, who agreed to sell the house for a small price. The, so the nuns set about you know, in fixing the place, and by 1950, they moved in to their new home. So that is the place of the monastery uh, today. 
Uh, however, way back in the 1990s, because of the construction of the C5, this uh, monastery was also demolished. And they had to transfer across the street to a property given to them by, uh, from what I heard, it's by Lusutan. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope that um, I, I hope I can answer the question, your questions that, that you are going to ask about this story of resistance in living through the hardships of a war. Maraming salamat at maraming salamat sa inyong pakikin. Thank you very much, Dr. Torres. And we will see you again later for our open forum. Now for our second speaker for this morning, we have Ms. Naomi Hemera from the University of Santo Tomas. Naomi M. Hemera is a graduate of the University of Santo Tomas and holds the degrees of Bachelor of Arts in History and Master of Arts in History. Currently, she is pursuing her doctorate degree in history at the University of the Philippines, Dilema. She taught history courses at Our Lady of Fatima University, Valenzuela, and the University of Santo Tomas. At present, she is working as an assistant professor at Colegio de San Juan de la Tran, Manila. Her research interests include the history of Philippine nationalism and the peace movement. Once again, Ms. Naomi M. Jimera. Ito po ang lahat na is kong uh, magpasalamat sa Veterans Memorial and Historical Division ng uh, PIVAO para sa kanilang imbitasyon na makapagbahagi po ngayong araw na ito sa Kagibinar Lectures. Um, nais ko pong uh, talakayin sa inyo ang kababaihan ng rebelyong pagbalahap para sa tema natin ngayong araw. Nagsimula bilang um, samahang gerilya ang hukbong bayan laban sa hapon o kilala sila sa tawag na hukbalahap o hooks At sila ay masidhing nagtaguyod ng pakikibaka sa sektor ng agrikultura sa gitnang Luzon. Um, kahit na nakilala ang hukbalahap sa pagiging gerilya na lumaban noong panahon ng hapon, uh, sila po ay may... Pundasyon, mahabang, uh, mahabang panahon ng feudalismo sa gitnang Luzon. Alam naman na po natin na sa gitnang Luzon, uh, ito po yung uh, melting pot ng uh, caciquism and landordism. No? Uh, panahon pa ng, uh, ng mga Kastila. Okay. At uh, nagkataon na dumating ang mga hapon, kaya uh, tinawag nila ang kanilang mga sarili na hukbalahap o hukbong bayan namin sa hapon. Sa pamamadugot po ng uh, PKP or Partido Komunista ng Pilipinas at pwersa ng mga magsasaka, opisyal na itinatag ang samahang ito sa kagubatan sa base ng arayat. Ang mahalagang maintindihan natin ang palapahama ng pakikibakong ito. At ito po ay ang uh, naglalayong mabago ang tabas ng ating lipunan sa pamamagitan ng paglipol ng feudalismo, imperialismo at uh, pasismo. At ito po ay maliwanag sa panahon ng pagkakabuo pa lang ng, uh, ng hukbalhap hanggang sa maging uh, HMB o hukbong mapagpalaya ng bayan matapos ang, ang gera. Dahil matapos po ng gera ay uh, kahit wala na mga hapon, pagdating ng mga Amerikano, ginawa nilang neo colonial state ang Pilipinas. Kung kaya't ito po ang naging dahilan kung bakit bumalik sa kabundukan ang mga hooks upang labanan ang gobyerno na tingin nila ay nagiging uh, puppet ng imperialismo ng Amerikano. Napakahalaga po ng uh, samahang girilang ito sapagkat sila lamang ang mayroong pambansang layunin. Para sa araw na ito, nais ko pong uh, bigyan ng karampatang pagkilala ang papel na kinampanan ng kababaihan sa rebelyong hukbalha. At ang kolektibong gintang ito ay nais kong ibahagi sa pamamagitan ng pagpapakilala sa tatlong mahalagang 
personalidad sa rebelyong ito. Okay? Sila po ang mga kababaihan na banggit din sa uh, sa autobiography ni Luis Tarupa, Supremo ng Balha. Um, magandang linawin muna natin ano, ang imahe ng kababaihan noong panahon ng gera. Um, marahil ay nagsimulang mabuo ang mga uh, mentalidad na ito. Kay ay na rin sa mga historiador tulad nila Encarnacion Alzola. Na ang tingin ng sa mga kababaihan, no, ang konbensyonal na tingin sa mga kababaihan ay relihiyosa, mahiyain, hindi makabasag pinggan. At walang mga kamalayan sa usaping pampolitika, palipunan. Sinabi ni Encarnacion Alzola no na uh, Nagsimula ito nung panahon ng mga Kastila, nung panahon na kumalat ang ang uh, katuruan ng uh, simbahang katolika. At naging uh, kasama na sa mentalidad ng mga tao na ang dalagang Pilipina ay si Maria Clara. No? Nakabuo tayo ng gantong uh, mentalidad. Okay? Uh, dahil nung panahon ng mga Kastila, uh, talagang sinabi na ang kapalaran ng kababaihan ay para sa pagiging madre o pagiging isang ina no na kung meron mang uh, mga paaralan na tumatanggap sa kababaihan ng mga panahon na yon iyon ay para um, turuan sila sa um, turuan sila sa mga gawaing bahay no turuan sila sa pagiging nanay at para turuan sila na na magbigay ng serbisyo sa simbahan. Um, talagang talagang nasa nasa gunita na natin, nasa pag-iisip na natin no na ang ang patriarkiya. Okay, dahil 'yun ang turo sa atin. Okay? Um, kala natin ang kababaihan ay para lamang sa uh, para lamang sa pananahi, sa pagluluto, sa musika at siyempre sa katekismo. Subalit so, uh, nang magsimula ang ikalawang digma ang pandaibig, nais kong ipunto dito na may mga ilan sa ating mga kababaihan ang lumihis sa tradisyong ito. Nang lalot na higit nung mapabilang sila sa kilosang hook. Um, nais ko muna ipakilala sa inyo okay, ang unang-una nating uh, personalidad, si Dayang Dayang. Okay. Um, si Felipe Colala po ay uh, membro ng uh, KPMT. At uh, mula sa, nagmula siya sa baryo ng Madili sa, uh, sa Pampanga. Okay. Bago pa man siya mapabilang sa Pugpalahap, nakakalap na siya ng um, tatlumpong tauhan. At meron silang mga armas saan nila nakuha ang kanilang mga armas nakuha po nila yon sa mga tumatakas na landlord sa mga may-ari ng lupa at habang kumukuha sila ng mga palay dahil isa po sa um, sa problema ng panahon ng Hapon ay yung akakapusan sa sa mga prime commodities lalo na ang uh, ang bigas ang pagkakulang sa bigas yun po ang Uh, isa talagang problema ng uh, ng panahon na yun. At habang kumukuha sila ng palay, may mga dumating na pulisya. Okay, mga pulisya. At nakakuha po nung may mga naarestong mga gerilya. At uh, ang ginawa po ni, uh, ni Dayang Dayang, okay, kumuha siya ng, kinuha niya yung pangalan Dayang Dayang. Okay, ang dayang-dayang po, uh, ang ibig sabihin ng dayang-dayang ay isang uh, prinsesang muslim na nanggaling sa mahabang uh, mahabang kasaysayan, no? Uh, pamilya ng uh, pamilya ng mga mandirigma. Sa habang hanay ng uh, mga mandirigma. At ang ginawa po ni uh, dayang-dayang ay sumugod siya sa municipal hall, sa munisipyo sa Kandaba at napatakas sa po yung mga uh, yung mga nadakip yung mga war prisoner at uh, bumalik din siya sa Mandili okay. at kagaya ng inaasahan niya uh, dumating po 
ang mga hapon. Gumanti po sila. Pero handa si Dayang Dayang. At uh, nakapatay siya ng tatlumpu hanggang apat na pong hapones. At napakahalaga po no, ng, uh, ng inkwentrong ito sa Mandili. No, kasi isa po itong uh, pruweba na uh, kayang talunin ng guerrilla tactics ang mga kalaban. Kaya noong, uh, noong mabuo ang hukbalahap, uh, 1942, Marso, nagpainhist si uh, Dayang Dayang at uh, nahalal siya na miyembro ng komite militar. Okay, napakataas po ng, uh, ng posisyon na ito. At uh, nag-iisang babae, no? siya ang nag-iisang babae na nahalal sa ganitong posisyon. Subalit, uh, nung, uh, nung, uh, nung makatanggap ng mga aligasyon, ang uh, nakarating ang mga aligasyon ng uh, ng pagsasamantala sa sa sarango sa kulit puro na ginawa daw allegedly no ni uh, ni Dayang Dayang na uh, ayaw niyang tumanggap ng mga utos no ayaw niyang tuma- tumanggap ng mga utos sa nakakata- nakakataas sa kanya at uh, uh, sinabihan niya ang mga kasamahan niya na mga uh, mga tao sa ilalim niya na tawagin siyang uh, generalia at uh, sinasabi may mga nag uh, may mga accounts na nagsasabi na kapag darating siya sa baryo kailangan may nakahandang mga manok, kailangan may nakahandang mga uh, mga pagkain at uh, may mga kaso rin ng uh, ng pagnanakaw at nakarating ito sa pulit puro. Okay. At dahil dito um, inakusahan siya or uh, sinenten siya na na napatayin kay that by firing squad. Uh, kaya yun, uh, binarin siya ni uh, Castro Alejandrino. Um, ito po ay sa kabila ng ganitong mga pangyayari. No? Uh, kasi uh, ang description kasi nila Lugustor kay, um, kay Dayang Dayang ay parang uh, tomboyish. Eh, no? um, takot ang mga lalaki sa kanya kasi malaking babae siya kaya tang parusang ginawa sa kanya pang panglalaki rin yun ang uh, analysis ng ilang mga historians and uh, scholars pero sa kabila ng mga ganitong pangyayari sa mga ganitong aligasyon no na natanggap niya nananatili sa isip ng mga tao na si uh, Dayang Dayang ay isang malakas at matapang na guerrilla yun po ang na-retain sa pag-iisip no, sa kamalayan ng mga tao. Okay. Susunod naman natin ay si Commander uh, Guerrero. Okay. Uh, bukod kay Dayang Dayang, isa sa mga nakilalang commander ay si Simeona Ponsalan. At nakilala siya sa tawag na uh, Commander Guerrero. Okay. Uh, nagsimula po siya, okay, nagmula po siya sa mahirap na Uh, na pamilya ng mga magsasaka at nang tumating ang mga hapon at uh, nagsimulang mangalap ng mga tao na magsisilbi sa pamahalaan, tumakas siya. Alam niya sa sarili niya na kailangan niyang tumakas para, uh, para mamundok. Um, nakapag-aral siya sa tinatawag na forest school. So ito po yung mga paaralan na uh, nasa kagubatan. Okay, at uh, tinuturo ang uh, mga doktrina ng uh, ng komunismo at uh, pinaglalaban pinaglalaban nila kung anong kanilang mga pinaglalaban at uh, matapos yun isa sa mga naging tungkuling ginampanan niya ay ang siguraduhin na maalam ang mga tao sa um, sa pakikibaka okay, laban sa hapon kung dahilan kung bakit sila makikibaka sa maikling panahon na naaresto siya, okay, pero dahil sa kawalan ng ebidensya, uh, pinakawalan din siya kaagad. At uh, pagbalik niya, naging uh, miyembro siya ng tinatawag na Apalit Squadron. At doon niya unang ginamit ang, uh, ang pangalang Commander Guerrero. At sa squadron na yon naging uh, director po siya, director ng pampolitika. At 
halos kagaya ng kanyang uh, nasimula, ng kanyang uh, naging tungkulin po ay ihanda ang mga tao <coughs> sa pakikipaglaban. Hindi lamang siya uh, kasama sa pag-iisip ng mga plano, ng mga, ng mga battle plans. Kasama rin po mismo siya sa mismong labanan. Okay. Siya po ang uh, namuno sa kanyang squadron at may napakahalaga po itong uh, layunin. At ito po ay makakala po ng mga armas sa pakiki, pakikidigma. Dahil isa po yan sa kakulangan sa rebellion po, mga armas. Um, mga armas po nila ay nanggaling sa um, mga naiwang armas ng mga Amerikano at Filipino sa Death March. At um, sinasabi rin po ng, uh, ng ilan no? uh, sa aking interview noong 2018 sa isang uh, Cook Balahak veteran, sinabi niya na isa sa mahalagang tulong din po ay yung mga uh, mga ayita, no? yung mga uh, mga ayta dahil nagbigay po ng mga uh, pana at sibat. At kahit na uh, ang kalaban nila ay uh, moderno, no, moderno ang mga armas, ang, ang mga hukbala ka po ay uh, nandoon no, yung kanilang um, yung kanilang katapangan. Okay, binibigyan nila ng positive side. Kahit ang hawak nila ay single shot uh, Remington at uh, pana at sibat na bigat ng mga bigay ng mga ayta natutuwa pa sila doon kasi hindi po nag-a-attract ng enemies dahil walang wala raw tunog so nakakapang-ambush po sila ng mga hapon lalo na sa gabi at um uh, inil, inilarawan po siya ni um ni Luis Taruk Uh, bilang eksperto sa automatic rifle at maaasahan po talaga sa labanan. Lalo na sa firing line. At uh, nakilala si Commander Guerrero na isang babaeng walang takot sa baril. Yun po ang kanyang uh, expertise. At uh, dumako naman po tayo sa ating uh, huling personalidad. Yan po si Commander Liwayway. Okay. Um, kung ilarawan po no, sa mga personal accounts, mga primary accounts, na dayang dayang at kirero, sabi nila, ani mo lalaki ang mga ito eh, dahil takot mismo ang mga lalaki sa kanila. Na malalaki ang kanilang uh, uh, katawan at pinatatakutan po talaga. Sa kontekstong ito, um, magiging... Uh, interesante ang susunod nating pag-uusapan. At iyan ay si Remedios Gomez na nakilala sa tawag niya Commander Liwayway. At uh, kumpara kila Commander Guerrero siya po ay galing sa isang may kayang pamilya. At ang tatay niya ay nahalal bilang mayor sa Mexico Pampanga. Okay. At habang ito ay Uh, mayor ng mga panahong ito, naging malapit ito sa mga magsasaka at naiintindihan niya ang nararamdaman ng mga magsasaka, no? ang hinain ng mga magsasaka. At dito po unang uh, nabuo ang simpatya ni, uh, ni Remedios. At uh, sa pagsama-sama niya sa tatay niya, no? uh, sumali siya sa mga, uh, sa mga beauty contest, no? sa mga, uh, sa mga ganong, patimpal, ganong klaseng Uh, patimpalak. Okay. At sa pagdating ng mga hapon, isa po siya dinakip at sinaktal o tinorture ang kanyang tatay. Dahil ayaw nitong makipagtulungan po sa mga hapon. At uh, eventually, namatay din po ito sa kulungan. At uh, ang ginawa po ng mga hapon ay ang bangkay nito ay uh, dinisplay. No? Uh, dinisplay po sa, um, sa, sa publiko. bilang maging uh, babala kung ano ang mangyayari sa mga tao na tumangging makipagtulungan sa sa mga hapon. Dahil uh, natatakot ang pamilya niya sa seguridad sa seguridad nila. Uh, tumakas po ang kanyang pamilya papuntang Tarlac. At tuon ay um, natuto siya ng doktrina ng komunismo sa pag-aalaga po ng mga hook guerrilla. Uh, matapos po ang 
uh, ilang buwang uh, pagsasanay, doon po siya nabinyagan bilang commander uh, liwayway ng Squadron 3V. At dumating pa nga po sa punto no, na meron po siyang uh, dalawang daang uh, lalaki under her command. At lalo pa siyang nakilala sa Battle of uh, Kamansi. No? Kasi kahit na mas marami ang pwersa ng mga hapon nag nagawa niyang Uh, nagawa niyang paatarasin uh, ang mga ito. At bilang commander, uh, siya po ang nag-uorganisa ng mga pagsasane sa kanyang squadron. Pinaminuan niya rin po ang operasyong militar laban sa mga garrison ng mga hapon at laban sa mga collaborators. Okay. Uh, gayon din po ang pagkuha ng armas at bala para sa hukbo tulad ng uh, tulad nila Commander Guerrero. Pero uh, kaiba po kila Dayang Dayang at Guerrero, si Commander Liwayway ay napanatili ang kanyang um, feminine side, no, yung kanyang pagiging mahinhin kumaga. Bago siya mang ambush po ng uh, ng mga Hapon, uh, maglilipstick muna siya, mag-aayos ng buhok maglalagay ng uh, nail polish. Okay. At hindi lang po iyon, no? um, nagdadala rin po siya ng, uh, ng pabango at, at mag spray sa mga kasamahan niyang madudumina at uh, pawisat. Kasi ganun po ang, uh, ang guerrilla warfare. Talagang raids and ambuscades po. Uh, hindi po sila nag engage sa frontal battle. So kapag ka uh, Uh, may nagagalit sa kanya dahil ni-sprayan niyo ng pabango. Nasa account po ito ni Luis Taro. Sabi po niya, bakit kayo nagagalit? One of the things that I am fighting for is the right to be myself. Okay. Yan po ang sabi niya. Subalit, um, sa kabila po ng uh, ganitong habit niya no, na mag-ayos sa kanyang sarili, hindi mo, hindi mo po siya maririnig na na magkwento tungkol sa damit, kung anong bagong pabango, tungkol sa kahit na anong pag, pagpapaganda dahil okupado na ng layunin ng kilusan ang kanyang isip at uh, gawa. Okay. Sa, sa kwento po ni Luis Taro, sinabi niya na uh, umupo siya sa tabi ni Commander Liwayway nung ito ay tinamaan ng, uh, ng malaria. At talagang sinabi po ng Supremo na tumutulo ang, uh, ang mga luha niya habang naririnig ang mga sinasabi ni, uh, ni Liwayway habang siya ay nagde-delirio. Dahil wala siyang ibang bukang bibig kundi ang kapakanan ng kanyang bayan. At um, makikita natin dito yung uh, pagmamahal niya. Uh, sa mga tao, no? sa welfare ng mga tao at sa kagustuhan niya na uh, sa kagustuhan niya na makalaya ang ang bansa sa mga hapon. Uh, matapos ang gera, uh, alam niyo po eh sumaling muli siya sa mga hook no? na na ngayon ay naging hook pong mapagpalaya ng bayan. Kagaya po ng nabanggit kanina po ano, um, ang mga hook balaha po ay namundok muli dahil matapos mapalayas uh, uh, ang mga hapon dito sa Pilipinas ang gobyerno po natin noon ay naging uh, sinasabi nilang puppet ng mga Amerikano okay, kaya sumali po siyang muli sa hukbong hukbo ng bayan laban sa hapon okay subalit so, uh, nadakip din po siya sa operations arayat ng 19 Uh, 1947. So balit sinabi niya na kung hindi siya nagdakip, patuloy pa rin ang kanyang uh, pakikibaka kasama ng, uh, ng hukbala. Para po sa ating pagtatapos, masasabi natin na um, wala sa konbensyonal na depenisyon ng Filipina si Nadayang Dayang Guerrero at uh, Commander Liwayway. At ang kanilang buhay at uh, pakikibigma ay nagbibigay ng panibagong imahe ng Pilipina. Hindi bilang relihiyosa, nananahe, nag-aalaga ng anak, kundi matapang na leader ng rebelyon. At 
Isa lamang po itong patunay na wala ang uh, usaping sekswalidad. Lalo't lalo na sa pakikipaglaban para sa pambansang layuni. Uh, yun lamang po at uh, maraming maraming salamat po sa, uh, sa pakikinig. Thank you very much, Ms. Hemera. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where our morning session ends. The afternoon session will proceed at exactly 12.30 in the afternoon. Now, while waiting, let us give you a virtual tour of our National Military Shrine. Inaaniyahan namin ang lahat ng makilahok sa pagdiwang ng Philippine Veterans Week at araw ng kagitingan. 